Good evening. Welcome back to Smyrna Christian Church, back in the book of Kings, picking it up, 2 Kings chapter 6 tonight. In our last study, you remember Naaman, he was one of the top people in the Syrian army. He had leprosy, and a few things happened that brought him to Elisha, the prophet of Israel, and God healed Naaman. And, that, and Naaman was actually converted. He wanted to only worship the true God, and We've seen many times that that would not be the case. People would see the miracles of God be performed, but they just go back and serve their own little idols, that little sticks or things that don't even exist. But Naaman, he was converted. So that, that was a great blessing to see. And then he brought all this gold and silver to, to try to pay Elisha for the miracle. But remember, it wasn't Elisha that did it. It was Almighty God that performed this miracle. But Elisha would not take a cent, just like Paul wouldn't take a cent. So no one could ever say that they do it for the money. They protected their credibility in that way. But then you had Elisha's servant Gehazi. He saw all that money and he wanted some of it. So then at, when Naaman left, Gehazi went and he ran down Naaman. And he just made up a complete lie saying that Elisha... Uh, and then needed some of this money for some of the sons of the prophets. So he got some of the money. He thought he got away with it. But Elisha came up to him and he said, Look, I know everything that you just did. And way more important than that, God knows. So Gehazi was struck with leprosy. And it's written in the last verse of chapter 5. He's going to have leprosy the rest of his life, I'm pretty sure it said. So, one of the, I mean, it's what, like I said yesterday, it's one thing to. We all mess up at times when we all sin, but when you do this, repent. But it's a whole different level to try to rip people off, even in the name of God, taking their money, ripping them off. That is a pure evil, and God's wrath will come down on you so hard for that. So that was how chapter 5 ended. We're getting into chapter 6. Let's ask a word of wisdom from our Father. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your written word and for giving us this place we can come and teach your word. We ask you to guide us through this study with your Holy Spirit. We ask you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear to understand and teach your word. We ask that your words be spoken and your will be done during this study. Thank you, Father. In Yeshua, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, we pick it up. 2 Kings <coughs> chapter 6, verse 1. And it reads, and the sons of the prophets, remember these are the, the students, those that are learning God's word. The sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell with is too straight for us. Saying, it's too small, but we need another building. This, this just really isn't enough for us. Verse 2. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make us a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. So Elijah's saying, That's fine. And notice that they basically lived at this school. I mean, they were dedicated to serving the living God and to learning his word. So they could probably go and ultimately become teachers. Then when you are, you want to be a preacher or whatever, a teacher of God's word, you do have to be dedicated. That doesn't mean that you can't do other things in life, but serving God, studying His Word, that always better be your number one priority in life as it was theirs. Verse 3, And one said, one of the sons of the prophets, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants, speaking to Elisha. And he, Elisha, answered, I will go. So they convinced Elisha to go with them. Verse 4, So he went with them, and when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water. And he cried and said, Alas, Master, for it was borrowed. And so they really needed that, of course. But and let's just keep reading it. Verse 6. And the man of God, that's Elisha, said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place. And he cut down a stick and cast it in thither. And the iron did swim. Now understand, this was a miracle from Almighty God. And when that says that he uh, he cut down the stick, that in the Hebrew means he he evenly shorn it, meaning that he he took some time, he, he made it right. Now what this is teaching us is, and it, it might not seem that big a bit, it might not seem like that big of a deal. Oh, well, we just lost an axe; they, they can find another one surely from somebody. They borrowed this one; surely they could borrow another one. But what this is teaching us is that even in the small things. God takes care of his own. 
And that as Elisha, he, he took time shorting the, the, the stick here. He, he did things right. He did it diligently. If we are trying our very best to serve God, even in the little small troubles that we have, God is always going to be there with us to take care of us. And that's exactly what this miracle is showing. And so God made it to where the, the axe head came up and, and they're going to have it. Verse 7. Therefore said he, take it up to thee. And he put out his hand and took it. So they got the axe. They're good to go once again. And remember, we do everything that we can do and then we leave it in God's hands. You don't want to go around and say, oh, well, I'm just going to let God take care of every little thing I ever do in my life. No, we do everything we can do, and you leave the rest to God, and He will take care of the rest. If you are diligently doing your best to serve Him. So that's what that miracle was teaching us. That's one of the last of, of Elijah. There's still a couple more. But remember, it's God that does the miracle, and it's all to teach us for, and to teach them at that time, of course. Okay, verse 8. Then the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. So he's trying to find a place to camp out so he can go attack Israel. Verse 9. And the man of God, once again, that's Elisha, sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. Now what this means, that thou pass not a place, what he's saying is that don't let this place go unattended. Make sure you got people there because this is where the Syrians are about to come and try to set up camp so they can attack. So understand, God has given Elisha the location of the enemy before they even go there. Verse 10. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of and saved himself there, not once nor twice. So this happened even more than twice. It happened several times. Then Dad would send his army there and what do you know, the Israelite army is already there. Because God warns those that serve him and protects us against our enemies. Verse 11. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing. And he called his servants and said unto them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? See, he thinks that he's got a traitor in his midst. Because he's thinking the only way that the Israelite army could be in all these places is one of you guys had to have told them. But no, that wasn't the case. Almighty God was telling Elisha so Elisha could tell Israel. So it was God that was doing this. But it would totally make sense that he thinks they have a traitor. Verse 12. And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king. But Elisha, the prophet that is in Israel, telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. I mean, he's telling, he, God is telling Elisha things that nobody else could possibly know. Even the things that you speak in your innermost chamber, king, God knows, and he's letting Elijah, Elisha know. So, if you are an enemy of God or an enemy of those who love God, God's going to make sure that God's people are going to have victory over you. No matter what, you can't hide your, even your thoughts from God. He knows everybody's thoughts. Verse 13. And he said, the king of Syria said, Go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. Talking about Elisha. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. And I think only Dothan's only mentioned one other place in God's word. It's Genesis 37. And that's where Joseph went to find his brothers, and then they sold Joseph into captivity, into slavery. Verse 14. Therefore sent ye thither horses and chariots and a great host, and they came by night and compassed the city about. When you read that compass the city about, you can't help but think of Luke chapter 21, verse 20, where it says that, um, that armies are going to surround Jerusalem right before the desolation comes. That's to say the abomination of desolation, which is the false Christ. So right before the false Christ comes, arrives, the armies are going to be surrounding Jerusalem. But just like God protected his people here, God is going to protect us, of course, again at that time. And that's future. Verse 15. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, Behold, an host, that means an army, compass, surround the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? It's just us two, and then there's a whole army against us. 
If you didn't know the power of God, you would think that Elisha and his servant were absolutely doomed. You'd think they would have no chance. But watch what we're about to see, verse 16. And he, Elisha, answered, Fear not. How many times in God's word does he let us know? You don't have anything to fear. If God's on your side, if God is for us, who can be against us? So Elisha says, Fear not. For they that be with us are more than they that be with them. He that is complete faith, that's complete confidence. And what we're about to see is that there's, I mean, there's a whole other dimension that we don't see. And let's read it here, verse 17. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Those same vehicles that we read about in 2 Kings chapter 1 and Ezekiel chapter 1. They have a whole army of angels round about to protect them. And it's exactly like what we read back a, a couple of weeks ago in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Remember, it was the same thing. God was letting Judah know exactly where the enemy was going to be, first of all, exactly like he was here. And then remember in about verse 20, God said that, it says that God sent ambushments. That's the heavenly army of angels. That's these chariots of fire that we don't even see. And make no mistake, many times, there's no doubt, if you're serving the living God, there's been times that you didn't even realize something maybe really bad was about to happen. And that heavenly host protected you, because that's in a dimension that we can't even see. But that army of angels does surround those that truly love God. So remember, it doesn't matter if you're outnumbered a billion to one. If God is on your side, you always have the majority, and you always have that army of angels that you can't see. But don't worry, they are there to protect you. And like it says in Psalms 34, verse 7, it says, The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear them, and or that fears him, that fears God, and he delivers them out of all their troubles. So you don't have to worry about anything. God protects his own, and he used that that heavenly army of angels to do it. Verse 18. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. So you see, God has the ability to close people's eyes, to blind them, and to open people's eyes like he was able to show Elisha's servant. But notice one other thing also that Elisha, he didn't have to see he didn't have to actually see those horses and chariots of fire. He knew that they were there. And just like now, you should absolutely always know that they are there to protect you if you are on God's side. But also, we have to take this in a spiritual level as well. God can open your eyes. If you study the Word of God all the way back to Genesis so you know what actually happened in the garden, you know that there was an earth age before this. If you take time to study that, God will give you eyes to see and ears to hear. He will open your eyes. But he also has the ability to close the eyes. And like it says in Matthew chapter 13, the disciples are asking Jesus Christ, saying, why are you speaking to us in parables? And Christ said, because for you it is meant for you to understand the kingdom, or to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. But for them it is not meant to under, it is not meant for them to understand. And it says, that, and that's how you, you understand God's elect, how they were chosen before the foundation of the world. And it says the same thing in Romans chapter 11, verse 7. It says that um, the election hath obtained it. They know the truth, but the rest were blinded. And well, why would God do that? Because he knows from the time before, when we were in spiritual bodies with God, he knows who can handle the truth and who can't. He knows, who, he knows who is going to make a stand for him and who won't because of that rebellion that took place in the first earth age. So God gives the truth to those who can handle it and those who he knows will stand up for him. And the rest are blinded. Why? For their own protection. So even if they are deceived, they can't have that opportunity in the millennium, that thousand year teaching period. So God can open eyes and he can close eyes. And your eyes are never going to be open if you don't take time to study God's word. So, okay, now, so God smote this army with blindness. Let's see what happens next. Verse 19. And Elisha said unto them, 
This is not the way, neither is this the city. Elisha told him, this isn't how you're going to find Elisha, but he is Elisha. That's who, they're looking for him. And he said, oh, you're not going to find him here. Follow me. I will bring you to the man whom you seek, which they're looking for him. But he led them to Samaria. So you see how God, God makes a way. Verse 20. And it came to pass when they were coming to Samaria that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes and they saw. And behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. 21. And the king of Israel said unto Elisha when he saw them, My father, that, that means my counselor, even um, Pharaoh would call Joseph his father in Genesis 45. But that just means that he's his counselor. So my father, my counselor, shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? I mean, the king of Israel, he's really just, just wanting to kill them all. But look what Elisha says, 22. And he, Elisha, answered, Thou shalt not smite them. Wouldst thou smite those whom thou hast taken captive with thy sword and with thy bow? Set bread and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. And you can't help but think of Romans chapter 12, verse 19 here, when it says, Don't take the vengeance upon yourself. Let God take the vengeance. And it says, give your enemies water to drink. Give your enemies food to eat. And by doing so, thou shalt eat coals of fire on their head. And so let God take the vengeance. And it says also, don't be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Verse 23. And he prepared great provision for them. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away. And they went to their master. So the bands of Syria came no more into the lands of Israel. That's the marauding bands that we read back of in, at the beginning of chapter 5. How they're just going around trying to rob people, trying to attack people. So there's not going to be any more of that. But as we're just about to see, Syria is still going to be at war against Israel. Verse 24. And it came to pass after this that Benadad, king of Syria, or king of Syria gathered all his hosts, all his army, and went up and besieged Samaria. Now, you see, this would not be happening if Israel would just turn to Almighty God. If they would repent of the idol worship and they, if they would just serve God. Because what does it say in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 7? God says that when a man's ways please the Lord, God even makes his enemies to be at peace with him. So you see, but then if you go against God, you serve idols, it says God, he will raise up an enemy against you. So that, that's exactly what's happening here. And that's you can also read that in the you have in the Le Leviticus chapter 26, you have the blessings that God will give you if you serve him, or you have the curses that God will put on you if you go against him. And that's what it says in Leviticus 26, 17. It says that that um, God will set his face against you if you go against him. He will raise up enemies against you. Verse 25. And there was a great famine in Samaria. And behold, they besieged it until an ass's head was sold for four score pieces of silver, and the fourth part of a cap of dove's dung for five pieces of silver. And that dove's dung, that's probably referring to a, a certain type of vegetable that was just so gross that, that it pretty much tasted like dove's dung. That's probably what that's talking about. But once again, Leviticus chapter 26 and verse 26, it lets you know, you want to go against God, there's going to be famine. And when you read about famine, you can't help but think of Amos chapter 8, verse 11, where God says the time's coming that there's going to be a famine, but it's not for bread, it's not for hunger, for bread, or for thirst of water, but it's for hearing the words of the Lord. Because so many churches, they decide that they got more important things to do, more religious things to do, than teach God's word exactly as it's written. And it just keeps getting worse and worse. So that famine... It's on. Like I said, it's going to keep getting worse. Verse 26. And as the king of Israel was passing by upon the wall, there cried a woman unto him, saying, Help, my lord, O king. And I mean, I guess it's okay she's asking the king for help, but who should she really be asking? She should be asking God for help. But Israel, they just, the ten northern tribes, they just couldn't get it through their head. If they would just call out to God, he would listen to them. And that's what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 29. It says, if you seek God with all your heart and soul, you will find him. And when you're in tribulation, if you turn to him and be obedient, he is merciful and he will not forsake you. 
So just turn to God. If once you repent of your sins, God erases them. And you're back in good standing with Him. So if they would have just turned to God, everyone thing would have been just fine. But they kept deciding to do everything else but that. Verse 27. And he, the king, said, If the Lord do not help thee, what shall I help thee? Out of the barn floor, out of the wine press? He's saying, I don't have anything out of the barn floor, out of the wine press to give you. And notice, what is the king really doing here? He's blaming God. And that's the, one of the biggest mistakes you could ever make, and we're going to talk about that a little more by the end of this chapter. Verse 28. And the king said unto her, What aileth thee? And she answered, This woman said to me, Give thy son that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. I mean, crazy, but that's what they did. They actually did that. Verse 29. So we boiled my son and did eat him, and I said unto her on the next day, Give thy son that we may eat him. And she had then her son. And guess what? This is also written in Leviticus chapter 26, verse 29. It says you're going to eat your own children. God's going to put that curse on you to where that's how crazy you're going to go without God. God knew that's what they would do. And guess what? That's exactly what happened. And it's not God that made them do it. But they just went so far away from God, so far out of their mind. That they ate their very own children. And you can't help but think of that on a spiritual level. That when the false Christ does arrive. It says that your own family members. Your own parents or your own children. Will deliver you up to the false Christ. Remember that is your destiny. Because you're, it's your job to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you. Verse 30. And it came to pass when the king heard the words of the woman. That he rent his clothes. And he passed upon the wall and people looked. He's just doing this for people to see him. And behold, he had sackcloth within upon his flesh. He didn't go into an inner chamber and, and mourn and repent. I mean, he did it on the wall so everybody could see it. Just wanting to be seen of men. And we've talked about it a couple times recently. I'll say it again. Matthew chapter 6 verse 5. says if you go, you want to stand on the street corner and just say all these long prayers so you can be seen of men? It says you have your reward. You're not going to get any reward from God. But he's only doing it to be seen of men. Verse 31. Then he said, God do so and more also to me if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, shall stand on him this day. I mean, blame Elisha now? It's sure not Elisha's fault. It's the king's fault. It's the people's fault for not turning back to God. But no, he's got to have a scapegoat with what's new under the sun. The same thing happens today in many different situations. Got to put the blame on somebody. But you see, Elisha is one of the few people that's trying to get them to turn back to God. But so the king's saying, I'm going to I'm going to make sure Elisha's, Elisha's dead. But have, do you remember Psalms chapter 105, verse 15? And also 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 12? God says, Touch not mine anointed and do my prophets no harm. You want to go against the one that loves God? You want to go against God's elect? you got big, big problems coming at you. Like it says in the gospel, it says that it would be better, someone who goes against someone that loves God, it'd be better for them that a millstone were cast around their neck and they'd be thrown and drowned in the sea rather than the wrath of God that's going to come down on them. Verse 32. But Elisha sat in his house, and the, elder, and the elders sat with him. And the king sent a man from before him. But, ere, but before the messenger came to him, he, Elisha, said to the elders, See ye how this son of a murderer hath sent to take away my head. Remember the king of Israel is Jehoram, and his parents were ah Ahab and Jezebel. Jezebel killed Naboth, killed a whole bunch of God's prophets. But you see, once again, God giving Elisha heads up so he knows what the enemy's trying to do. And the king of Israel should have known Elisha, or God was telling Elisha where the enemies, the Syrians, were going to be at. Why does the king of Israel think it would be any different now if he wants to set himself against Elisha? He, he just doesn't get it. But God protects his own. Look, when the messenger cometh, shut the door and hold him fast at the door. Is not the sound of his master's feet behind him? Verse 33 to complete the chapter. And while he had talked with them, behold, the messenger came down unto him. And he said, Behold, this evil is of the Lord. 
What should I wait for the Lord any longer? Saying, what, why should I hope in God anymore? I mean, just a pure evil mindset. Once again, blaming God. Now, that, that word messenger, it's believed by most that, you see, the word messenger in the Hebrew is malak. And the word for king in the Hebrew is malek. So it's almost the exact same. And it's believed that that word messenger should have been translated as the king. And that does make sense when we get into chapter 7. But either way, it really doesn't matter because whoever said it, those were the king's thoughts. Where the king said it or where he was telling the messenger to say it. It was the king's thoughts. Oh, God brought all this upon us. There's no reason for me to hope anymore. Well, if you want to be like that, then go ahead and be miserable. Be stupid. You want to blame all your problems on God. Say, oh, I don't want to trust in God anymore. I said, be miserable. Have a nice life. Just, that's the stupidest thing you could ever do. And it says in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 33 through 40, it says, if you want to keep saying the burden of the Lord, keep blaming all your problems on you, or uh, keep blaming all, your, blaming all your problems on God, God says, I will utterly forget you and forsake you. So that's the stupidest thing you could ever do. So don't blame your problems on God. But turn back to Him. And like I said, your sins will be forgiven. And He will. He will put your in, He will put your enemies at peace with you. So just trust in Almighty God and never blame your problems on God. And, and once again, remember, not once again, but remember 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. It says, There's nothing that happens to you that's not common to everybody. So don't be saying, oh, look at everything God brought on me. No, it's the same. There's nothing new that, to you that's not common to most people in the world. And it says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that God won't let anything happen to you that you can't handle. And God will always give you a way out. So if you want to go put your problems on God, fine. Be miserable. Or you could repent of your sins, turn to God, and be blessed. And like I said, the ten tribes of Israel, they just couldn't get it. But we'll continue. We'll see what happens in chapter 7. You do not want to go against someone that serves the living God. Let's go to our Father's throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word and for protecting us from our enemies. We thank you for giving us this place we can come and teach your word exactly as it's written. And we thank you for giving us your word. And we just ask you to, we ask you to continue to guide us with your Holy Spirit and give us understanding, not just for ourselves, so we can share it with others. Thank you. We love you so much, Father. In Yeshua, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. This is recorded April the 22nd, 2021 at Smyrna Christian Church in Kokomo, Indiana by Pastor Jesse Sisk. God bless.